Hey, good morning, church. Curtis Barnes, Discipleship Pastor here. So glad that you have joined us for worship this last week of November. We're setting our sights on December, so a couple of things for you to remember. First off, next week, December 3rd, we'll have our monthly prayer service. We'll be at 6 p.m. in the venue. We're gonna take that time and pray for our church as we wrap up this year, begin to set our sights on next year. Also, as we look at December, think about Christmas coming up, we have a gift for you today. We've got an Advent book uh, available outside the venue and outside of Sanders Hall Worship today. We hope you'll get this daily readings through the month of December to help focus our hearts and our minds on Christmas. It begins December 1st. Some of you may miss a day or two, so if you wanna get started early, that's fine. You're like, oh, but the schedule's off. Well, just mark it out and write the day in, all right? You'll be fine. And don't forget your reading glasses, all right? If you're over, let's say 50, like some of us are, you may need those. Great book, great resource. We hope it'll be a blessing for you and your family during the Christmas season. Whether you're online or in person with us today, we are so glad that you're here to worship with us. Good morning, if you will stand to your feet with us. It's good to be together in the Lord's house this morning. We serve a God that is all powerful, that is, can do anything that we pray for, that we ask for this morning. We believe in his power. We're going to sing about that as we get started today. the 
stone that was rolled at the tomb in the garden. What happens when God says to move? I feel it moving it now. I feel it doing it now. I feel it doing it now. Do it now. Do it now. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Ezekiel 37 says that we serve a God who can make dry bones, dead bones come to life. Hey, if you would go find a few people around you, tell them hello this morning, and then you can make your way back to your seat. All right, well, good morning. You guys can have a seat. I know it's hard to sit down after that song. I mean, it kind of got you going, right? Hey, uh, welcome to Gar Springs. If you're a first time visitor today, we're so glad to have you here. This is our venue service. And as you were walking in, you should have got one of these. This is our worship guide or bulletin. And so if you'll go ahead and grab that out, everyone, there's a lot of information in there as we kind of move into the Christmas season. In fact, uh, we are moving into Advent today, and so we're going to get to that in just a second. But if you are here to help us with our offering today, you can go ahead and start making your way to the front because we're going to do this uh, right after that. So as you open up your bulletin today, you're going to see some different ways that you can participate in serving this week. Um, one of the things that's new is that if you would like to give for Giving Tuesday, this, this Tuesday you can uh, give an offering to uh, our local partners here. And so that goes to help and serve the ministries that we partner with. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we want to just kind of move our hearts as a church to think about this time and this season, uh, it is all about Jesus. And so if you're wondering what Christmas is all about, it's not about the presents, it's not about the gifts, it's about Jesus. And so as we do that, we wanna focus on scripture, we wanna focus on what God has called us to do, each and every individual, and as, as well, each and every family that's in here, what God has called us to do to be obedient to that. And so here in a little bit, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about um, our Advent series, and then uh, today we're actually gonna end our Joseph series uh, in Genesis, and then we're gonna move into 
the road to Christmas. And so I know you are excited about that. Holiday season is here. Some of, some of that brings on anxiety. Some of that brings on a lot of pressure, a lot of a lot of families, you know, this is just a difficult season, but a lot of families in here, you're going into a joyful season. And so whatever season you're in, we want it to be filled with Christ. And so as we get ready to worship this morning, let's just fixate our eyes and our hearts and our attentions on Jesus. So I'm going to pray and we're going to take the offering. And then today we have the Draper, Draper family that's going to lead us with our Advent series. Let's pray. God, we thank you again for meeting with us this morning. We thank you for the fact that you are God that makes all things new. And even when bones are dry and dead, you breathe life. And this morning, there could be families that have walked in or individuals that have walked in. They just feel dry and dead. It's just been a hard season. And spiritually, they don't feel connected to you. But we know that you make all things new. And Jesus, that you came on mission so that we might have life and life abundantly. And so today we, we think on that and we praise you for that. And we, we ask that you would just do a work in this room today for every person that's here to receive your word and that it might transform their heart so that they might be conformed to your image. God, we also wanna to bring to you our tithes and our offerings today. And we know that as we give, we give as a church ultimately to live on mission here locally and nationally and all across the world. And so God, would you bring a heart of generosity today as we give, but more than that, would you use it for your glory and for your kingdom expansion? We think for the opportunity to, to pause and to pray and know that as we pray right now, God, that you are a God that hears. And even as our hearts are in tune with worship, God, if there's prayers that need to be prayed today, God, we pray ultimately that you would receive that and you would take action on that. And in our faith, God, that you would move in this holiday season, us towards you. God, we do thank you again for this time and we ask that you would just hear our hearts cry this morning. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray, amen. Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. We light this candle today out of thankfulness for the fulfilled promise of our Savior Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. We give thanks and praise in Jesus' name because in him, we find hope. All right, let's stand back together. Is because of the hope that we have in Jesus this morning that we can sing, that we can declare God's faithfulness in our life and his power. And so uh, we want to do just that. We get an opportunity to do that together this morning in corporate worship. And so we want to worship the Lord uh, in all the ways that he's provided for us.
walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and gray They were like mountains that stood in our way Yeah.
wash away the blood of Christ. blood of Christ. Lord, it's not anything that we can do or bring to the table this morning. Lord, but you call us when we see you for who you are, when we understand the gospel truth that you have sent your son for us. He lived a perfect life and died a death on the cross and was buried and was resurrected. God, when we believe in that, when we put our faith in that, Lord, we can have the hope and the peace we have just sung about this morning. So God, I pray that for every heart. I pray that for every person in the room today, Lord, that they would know the saving power and the peace and the hope that comes from knowing Jesus, from experiencing his love, his goodness. So this morning, Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us to worship you together. And Lord, we just pray that as we hear your word this morning, Lord, that our hearts be ready to receive, or that we would open ourselves to hear from your spirit. You would guide us, lead us, shape us today. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. this morning we will uh, wrap up Joseph because Christmas is coming so we're a little pressed this morning we're going to plow through three chapters you'll have to hang on for that ride the 13 chapters in Genesis as we've studied Joseph remind us of the sovereign hand of God in both good and bad circumstances and I was uh, reflecting this week on where we've been and what we've covered. And I, I thought about Paul's words in Romans 8. Perhaps Paul was reflecting on his life and perhaps the Holy Spirit who inspired uh, the writing of Scripture also reminded Paul of the life of Joseph when he wrote these words from Romans 8. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. If God is for us, who can be against us? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Joseph could have easily, at the end of his life, penned those words. Because he knew that God loved him through all that he had gone through. He knew that God had not abandoned him. He knew that God was working his perfect plan and purpose in and through Joseph. And think about it, with that understanding of the, of the plan and purpose of God and the love of God, Joseph was able to be free from bitterness in spite of everything that had happened to him. Joseph was able to have unwavering faith in God, even when his brothers abandoned him and sold him into slavery, he had faith that God was present in his life. Joseph didn't stop believing in the justice of God, even when he was wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife and consequently thrown into prison. And Joseph knew that God had not abandoned him, even when the chief cupbearer forgot about Joseph and let him languish in prison. And I think most importantly, Joseph remembered 
through all of that that he was a servant of God. And so when he became the prime minister of Egypt, he had the right attitude and the right heart uh, to be in that position. Well, 17 years have passed from where we left off two weeks ago. 17 years have passed since Jacob and his descendants have settled in Egypt in the land of Goshen. And so this morning we pick up the story in chapter 48 of Genesis. Read with me in Genesis chapter 48. After this, Joseph was told, behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, also Bethel, in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and I'll make you a company of peoples and give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. And the children that you father after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. As for me, when I came from Padan to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way, while there were still some distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me here. By the way, that is because Jacob was nearly blind at this point. That's why he asked, who are these? Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. Behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. Joseph took them, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left, because Ephraim was the second born. Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, because he was the firstborn, and he brought them near him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the, hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless these boys. And in them let my name be carried on and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he took his father's right hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He shall become a people, and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall be a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. Then he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given, you, I have given to you rather, to, to your, rather than to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. There's no other mention of this uh, mountain that he took from the Amorites, no other mention of that in Scripture, but evidently that was an additional uh, gift that he was giving to Joseph. So in chapter 48, we see that Jacob is nearing the end. Um, he's nearly blind. He's quite weak. He sends for Joseph. He summons Joseph because he wants to talk about some important matters. And his primary concern in sending for Joseph is that he wants to bless Joseph and then to adopt Joseph's two sons as his own sons. In chapter 49, we're going to see that Jacob is indeed going to do as every father would do. He's going to bless all of his sons, but the firstborn son always receives a special blessing, and the firstborn son receives a double portion of the inheritance. Well, Reuben is actually the firstborn of the 12 sons, but Jacob here is blessing Joseph through his two sons. He's blessing Joseph as the firstborn. Why is that? Well, Reuben has been displaced because of the sin he committed in sleeping with Jacob's concubine. 
And then the adoption of Joseph's uh, two sons, Ephraim, his, his firstborn, Manasseh and Ephraim, gives them the same status as Joseph's brothers. Now, this can get kind of confusing. If you go to the book of Numbers and you read of the 12 tribes of Israel and the allotment given them, um, you don't see Joseph there. You don't see Levi there. And now Jacob has 14 sons. He's got the 12, and he has adopted these two of Joseph. Well, how do you get 12 tribes out of 14 sons? Here's the simple math. 14 um, minus 2 you take out Levi and Joseph. Joseph is not going to be one of the 12 tribes. His two sons are going to receive that blessing. You take out Levi because the tribe of Levi was a priestly line. Uh, they don't receive a, a land inheritance. So you take out those two and you come up with 12 that with Ephraim and Manasseh replacing Joseph. Now, something interesting that we just read, you may not have picked up on in in blessing Joseph's sons, Jacob reverses the birth orders. Is that important? Yes, because the firstborn receives, again, a, a greater blessing. Manasseh is actually the firstborn, but Jacob gives the firstborn blessing to Ephraim. Interestingly, as you read through the Old Testament, you see this happens uh, many times. We, we read that Joseph was upset. He tried to tell his father, no, 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 you, you've got it all reversed. You need to put your right hand on Manasseh because he is the firstborn. But what has Jacob said? Son, listen, I know. You see, God has given Jacob specific instruction and guidance in giving the blessing. And here's the reality. When you see that periodically throughout Scripture, God chooses the secondborn over the firstborn, first of all, God knows. And many of the firstborns did quite a bit of evil. Not that secondborns were perfect, but God knew, and, and he knew their faith, and he knew their level of obedience. But most importantly for us to remember is very simply this. God is not a politically correct being. Okay? He's not. And he will do what he chooses to do. It may have been politically correct in their day and their culture for the firstborn to always receive the, the double blessing, the inheritance, but God is not politically correct. God does what God will do. And so Ephraim receives that, that blessing. And actually, as, as Jacob is giving the blessing, not only to Joseph's two sons, but we'll see this again in chapter 49, is he's giving the blessing. It's actually um, a, a prophetic word. Ephraim will become much more influential than any other tribe. In fact, if you look through Isaiah and, and Jeremiah, often when God is referring to the people of Israel, the name Ephraim is used to refer to the nation of Israel. So this adoption of Joseph's son also is a foreshadowing. We've seen a lot of foreshadowing in the story of Joseph of what is to come. Well, this adoption is a foreshadowing of what is to come for you and for me. For all those who accept salvation through what Christ has done. If you are in Christ, you are adopted as a son of God. And this is a foreshadowing as he adopts these two sons of Joseph. You know, what you see in chapter 48 is kind of a, a, a new, um, refreshing view of Jacob. Jacob, finally, it appears, has grown into a godly man of faith. He is um, much more like his grandfather Abraham than he had been earlier in his life. And as you look in chapter 48 and see all the things that Jacob shared about his relationship with God, you know, in the past we've seen that Jacob was always whining and complaining about the difficulties of life. Well, now his focus is on God and on the blessings of God. Let, let me just run through real quick. Verse 3, he says, God appeared to me at Luz. That's also Bethel. He blessed me. He promised to make me fruitful. He promised to give me the land of Canaan as an everlasting, everlasting possession. Verse 11, Jacob tells Joseph, God has allowed me to not only see you again, he's allowed me to see your children. Verses 15 and 16, Jacob declares, God has been my shepherd all of my life and has delivered me from all harm. And then verses 21 and 22, he reminds Joseph of the truth that he has learned in his own life. He says, God will be with you, and he will take you back to the land of your father. So Jacob has made a complete uh, turnabout from what we have seen through the story of Joseph. He's been transformed, and it's a wonderful transformation that's occurred in his life. Chapter 49, we're not going to read chapter 49. In chapter 49, all of Jacob's sons gather. Uh, in your Bible, like in mine, it probably uh, has a heading over chapter 49 of Jacob blesses his sons. But verse 1 of chapter 49 is a bit more accurate when you read Jacob gathers his sons so he can tell them what will happen to them in the days.
days ahead. Again, his words of blessing are prophetic. Um, and if, if you have studied history and you've studied the 12 tribes of Israel, you can see in this blessing given to each of his sons, you can see the history of what's going to happen in that tribe. I do want to look at one tribe, and that is the tribe of Jacob. Um, as Jacob is speaking these words over his sons, speaking about what's going to happen, um, the, the speech or the blessing over the tribe of Jacob is especially important. That's in verses 8 through 12, if you'll glance there. It's interesting, Jacob does not mention it before he gives. He mentions with some of the other sons, the sins they committed that cost them something in their inheritance. He doesn't mention um, when he addresses Judah, Judah's suggestion that they sell Joseph as a slave. He doesn't mention uh, Judah's sin with Tamar. Why is that? Because Judah, like his father Jacob, is now a completely different man. And, and Judah's estimation in the eyes of Jacob has risen through the years. First of all, because Jacob, or excuse me, Judah was the one who said that he would give himself as a pledge for the safety of Benjamin. And I'm sure when, when Jacob was reunited with Joseph, Joseph told him that Judah had made a very compassionate plea for the life of, of Benjamin, his younger brother. Judah had made some mistakes, as, as every man does, but he also had made things right with his father and family. Reuben had not done that. Uh, Simeon and Levi, who slaughtered the people of Shechem, they had not done that. They had never confessed and they had never repented of their sin. And so the blessing given to Je Judah is significant because he's now being recognized as the authoritative head of this family. He's not the firstborn, but he's being recognized as authoritative head of the family. And, and J Jacob says to Judah, your brothers will praise you. Verse 8, your father's sons will bow down before you. What does that refer to? It refers to the future of what's coming through Judah. What's coming through Judah? The, the line of kings, the dynasty of kings, starting with David and with, with Solomon. And so it refers to that, but also the ultimate fulfillment of your father's sons will bow down to you is the fact that through the line of Judah comes the Messiah, and before the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. Verse 10, he says, the scepter shall not depart. Uh, the scepter not departing, departing from Judah refers to the kings of Israel coming down in Judah's line. But most importantly, the scepter shall not depart is that in the lineage of Judah is the king of kings, the one who will reign and rule forever. His kingdom will never end. Look at Jacob's final words in verses 29 through 33. He gives instruction after he is blessed and declared these prophetic words over his sons. He gives instruction to his sons in those last four verses. He wanted the assurance that they would bury him not in Egypt, but they would bury him in the cave of Machpelah. That's where Abraham and Sarah are buried. That's where Isaac and Rebekah are buried. That's where Leah is buried. He wants to be sure that he is taken back to the land of Canaan and buried there. Now, chapter 50. Let's read verses 1 through 6 of chapter 50. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept with him for 70 days. When the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I'm about to die in my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father. Then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. You know, if you have been blessed with a uh, faithful and loving father, you can certainly understand the grief of Joseph, especially in thinking of all the years that he missed. You know, when a, when a father dies, a father that his sons especially have been close to, when a father dies, it it's almost has a, a sense of feeling that son left orphaned. There, there may still be other family uh, alive and around, but, but it's hard not to feel orphaned and, and kind of set adrift. And hopefully... 
If you've lost a father, you've been comforted, as Joseph would be, knowing that his father is with the Lord, knowing that your father's in heaven, but that joy is still tempered with a bit of grief because you know you won't ever hear his voice again or his, enjoy his laughter or be blessed by his, his prayers and his godly words of, of encouragement. And so for Joseph, this was a, a huge, huge loss. And you see that it took 40 days um, to have his father embalmed. That's kind of surprising to us in our day, but the Egyptians had a very particular process of embalming. And so 40 days for embalming, and then you notice it says that there was also 70 days of mourning. And it's interesting that not only uh, Jacob's family mourned, but the Egyptians did as well. Why is that? Out of their incredible love and respect for Joseph. They, they hardly knew Jacob. He lived in the land of Goshen. He'd been there 17 years. But they had incredible love and respect for Joseph for all he had done for them and also because of his integrity. That Joseph always acted with integrity. He always treated people justly and fairly. So it says that all of the Egyptians from Pharaoh on down felt his loss and were involved in, in mourning uh, Jacob. And then Joseph seeks uh, Pharaoh's permission. He was still a man under authority. He seeks Pharaoh's permission to go and to bury his father back in Canaan. Now, we're not going to read all of chapter 50, but as you scan down through there, the funeral procession was quite large. It was not only all of Jacob's family, but you had all of these officials and dignitaries of Egypt that were part of that uh, funeral procession. They arrive in Canaan. And there's another mourning period of seven days. It's on a, on a threshing floor, which is an elevated spot. And I'm sure all of the people around could see what was happening and probably wondered um, what great person had died. And after that additional seven days of mourning, J uh, Joseph and Jacob's other sons honored the request of their father, and they buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah, where he had requested to be buried. Now, verses 15 through 21 uh, give us interesting insight into Joseph's brothers and their understanding of their relationship with Joseph. In 15 through 21, after they returned to Egypt, his brothers began to wonder. Maybe they began to have this discussion on the way back as they thought about all that had transpired in their lives. They began to wonder, uh, what if Joseph was only kind to us to please our father? Only because our father was still alive. What if, what if now that Jacob is gone and he's out of the way, Joseph remembers all the evil that we've done to him? Even the evil that we did, the way that we treated him as a boy before we sold him into slavery. What if Joseph remembers all of that evil and, and now he's going to extract his vengeance? And do you see Joseph's response there? When he found out that that's what his brothers were thinking, it says that he wept. It grieved him. They still didn't fully understand the forgiveness that they'd been granted. I wonder sometimes when we cycle back around to sins that we've committed against the Lord, that we've already confessed and repented, and, and, and Satan convinces us to still dwell on that and feel the guilt over that, I wonder how much that grieves our Lord. Joseph was grieved that his brothers still didn't believe the forgiveness. And so what does he do? He reminds him, look, everything that I experienced was under the direct hand of God. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter what you think you caused. Everything I experienced was under the direct control of God. God moved me from my family into slavery. God moved me from slavery to prison. God moved me from, from prison to Pharaoh's house. It was all God. That was all his hand. That was all his control. And God did that. Why? Because he had a plan. Joseph couldn't initially see the plan. His brothers could certainly not have seen the plan. But God had a plan for the descendants of Jacob. God had a plan for the nation of Israel. His plan was to save many lives. What does that mean? Well, it certainly meant to save the lives of Jacob and his sons so there would be a nation of Israel. But it even went beyond then. God's plan extended beyond Joseph's family. God's greater plan was this, to make redemption available to the entire human race. All of that through Joseph. All of that in spite of what his brothers did. In fact, all of that came about because of what his brothers did. God allowed it. It's part of his plan. What does that say to us? Well, God works in our lives for blessing, for our own blessing. 
God works in our lives to make us more and more like his son, but we have to remember his plans extend beyond what we can see or what we can comprehend. We have to trust his sovereignty. We have to believe when the scripture says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has for those who love him. We have to believe that's true regardless of what we see with our physical eyes, regardless of what's happening around us. Joseph reminded his brothers that God was sovereign in everything that happened. And it was all according to the the plan and the, the purpose of God. The final verse of chapter 50 tells us of Joseph's death at 110. And you see that he reminds his brothers of the promise that God gave to the sons of Jacob that they would have a land. And then he instructs them as his father had done, be sure when you leave this land and you go to the promised land, be sure that my remains make the exodus with you. And we know that 400 years later as they exited Egypt, the bones of Joseph were taken with them back to Canaan. Well, we ran through three chapters this morning. I hope you'll take time. If you haven't already, I hope you'll take time to read them. I want to take the last few minutes this morning as we've been now uh, 11 weeks in the study of Joseph. I want to take a few minutes to talk about some lessons that we have learned from Joseph's life. And there there are many. There are more than we could cover this morning. But I just kind of narrowed it down to what I think are the five most important and most applicable lessons we get from the study of Joseph. Number one, maybe I've said this a time or two before. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. That, that's the most important lesson we can get. He is control in, in control of our circumstances. Even when to us it looks like things have gone wrong, things have gone off the rail, God is sovereign. God will give us uh, assignments. He'll expect us to work with all of our might, to be responsible for our own actions. But beyond that, it's all up to him. God is sovereign. And God is sovereign, not just in the bad, difficult circumstances. God is sovereign in the good. We need to stop and thank him because he's sovereign in the good. God is sovereign. Secondly, God's plans for you are special and unique. The way that God treats you, the way that God uses you, the way that God moves you, the way that God directs your life and your path is not like anyone else. Don't look around and see, well, well, she's got this going for her. He's blessed in this way and I'm not. No. The plans and purposes that God has for you are special and unique. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has specific plans and purposes for your life. And those, those plans and those purposes are specific to you. Don't look around and compare to others and see what God is doing or how God is moving or how God is using or how God is blessing others. His plans and purposes are specific for you. Number three, God has the right to take revenge, not us. There are going to be times that there are difficult circumstances. There are going to be times that there is even suffering. And maybe a particular person is responsible for our suffering, but we are never to repay evil with evil. God is the only one who has the right to to, to exact revenge. And when you take matters into your own hands, what you do is first you short circuit the work that God is trying to do in you. But then you also short circuit the work he's doing in the wrongdoer. Let God handle it. Number four, as God's people, we're to always work toward reconciliation, not revenge. Reconciliation and forgiveness should be the top priority in our lives all the time. You remember in Matthew 5 in in the uh, Sermon on the Mount as Jesus was talking about a variety of topics and he got to the point of talking about forgiveness and he connected it to worship and he said if you if you come to the altar if you come to worship and you bring a gift uh, for God as you come to the altar as you come for worship and and while you're there while you're kneeling there preparing to worship or getting involved in worship you remember that there's a problem between you and a brother well you get up you just leave your gift there and you get up and you go take care of the problem first and then you come back because then your heart is prepared for worship We need to be careful that we're always looking, especially in relationship within the household of faith, but really in all of our relationships with everyone, always looking and moving toward reconciliation and toward forgiveness. And then number five, 
And this is where I think we landed this week in, in seeing the death of Jacob and the death of Joseph. God is honored and we are blessed when we finish well. Of course, it's important how we live. But you know what people remember the most about you? Is how you finished. How you finished. And it's so wearisome and so discouraging to see, I'm, I'm just going to speak to men right now, to see men who don't finish well. Who don't bring honor to the name of God in their, in their last days. You know, as long, and, and you may be here this morning, and, and maybe, you're, maybe you're like a Joseph. Maybe you've lived well for the Lord all your life. That's great. You may be like a Jacob, and for a lot of years, you didn't live well for the Lord. You didn't live by faith. You didn't walk by faith. But Jacob made a turn. There was a transformation. And you know what? Wherever you are this morning in your walk with the Lord and your journey of faith, as long as there's breath in your lungs, if you're not happy with how that journey has gone so far, as long as there is breath in your lungs, you can choose to finish well. Paul said what? We, we set the past behind and we press forward to what's ahead. Would you bow with me this morning? It's been a great great study of Joseph and the great thing about the study of Joseph is it is so applicable in our lives today so much we can learn and, and the theme if there was just one theme we'd have to say it is that God is sovereign and, and I guess the question for all of us this morning is wherever we are in, in good circumstances or bad can we trust in the sovereignty of God. Can we trust in the sovereignty of God? Joseph was blessed through all of his life because he just faithfully served the Lord. Didn't worry about what circumstance he was in. Didn't worry about what the outcome might be. Didn't worry what the future held. He just faithfully served the Lord with great integrity. And then you've got Jacob. Not so much. You wonder how Joseph, maybe it's because God removed him from that home. You wonder how Joseph was so faithful when he had a, a father who continually faltered. But what we see is the great transformation that occurred in his life. What we see is the fact that he finished well. That he not only spoke of the blessings of God in his life, but he pointed his sons to faith and trust. In God. You know, for all of us gathered here today and watching online, for those gathered in the venue, we're, we're all across the spectrum in our walks with the Lord. But today, wherever we are, can be a fresh start. We can decide today, God, I want to honor you. I want to run the race. I want to finish well from this day forward. God, forgetting what is past, forgetting what's behind from this day forward, I want to walk by faith. I want to honor you. So where are you today? Perhaps you're here today and that journey of faith starts with committing your life to Christ. Maybe you've never done that. You may attend church all the time. But you've never made the decision to surrender, to say, Lord Jesus, I can't live the life you made me to live because I'm a sinner. I don't have a relationship with God because my sin has separated me from God. But Jesus, you have paid the price for my sin. And, and that is the only price that is sufficient. So I accept the price that you've paid. And I give myself to you. I receive you as Savior and give myself to you as Lord. And today I choose to begin to walk with you. That's where you are today. There are pastors, even now while I'm speaking in the back of this room, there are pastors in the back of the venue. You can just get up and slip out right now and make your way to one of those pastors. Most of us know the Lord. Most of us have made him Lord of life. The question is, are we walking with him as Lord of life? And this morning, if one of our pastors can, can help you get back on course, that's why we're here. If we can pray with you, if we can give you biblical counsel, 
You can speak to a pastor now. You can speak during the closing response song after the service. But would you really allow the Holy Spirit today to speak to you about where you are in your walk with the Lord and where he wants you to be? What has the Spirit of God said to you and how do you need to respond?
ahead and have a seat for just a moment. Well, amen, indeed. We stand in the power of Christ. And uh, as we close out today, I just want to draw attention to the holiday season. Once again, uh, a lot of times you have family come in, and today we have the family, the Burlesons, in with us today. And so I wanted to draw attention to that and just uh, give our people a little bit of an update. Uh, if you don't know this, uh, church health, has been said before, is really evaluated, not by the seating capacity, meaning not how many chairs we have in the room, but our sending capacity, where we're living on, on mission in all areas of the world. And so, Tyler, it's so great to have your family back today. Can we get a little bit of update of what it's like to be in Mississippi State World? Yeah. Well, first of all, Starkville's not that bad. Okay, so for all of you that were worried for us, it's been, it's been great. We've been getting uh, settled over the last two months, and uh, we've just really been blown away uh, just at God's kindness, His uh, generosity uh, toward us, and the way that He has provided for us, the way that you guys have prayed for us, encouraged us, supported us. I can't tell you enough how much we have literally felt that. I mean, we have felt that every moment uh, so far uh, as, we've, as we've launched out. Um, we've been having a Bible study on Wednesday nights. Uh, we've been seeing about 25 to 30 people come to that uh, already, uh, just kind of through word of mouth and through God just opening doors through relationships that we already have that have been like, hey, my, my brother's uh, cousin's son goes to Mississippi State, you know, those kinds of connections. And so, uh, Two quick things over the last couple of weeks. We had a vision night a few weeks ago, so we've been meeting as a Bible study for a couple months, and we're starting to kind of uh, push commitment uh, to the people that have been attending and starting to talk about what it means to be a church and to be committed to what God is doing. Uh, so we had a vision night. It was great. Uh, we really saw God do some cool things through that. And then about a week and a half ago, we hosted uh, what we call, so our church name is Church of the Heights. So we did Heights Giving. So we did a Thanksgiving uh, meal a week and a half ago, and we had about 40 people in our house. Uh, for this uh, dinner. And so it was really cool just to see all the crazy ways that God is just kind of forming his church and forming a local body of believers. Uh, and even some that we, we aren't sure if they have a relationship with Jesus that, that have just come because they wanted good Thanksgiving food. Uh, and so we're, we're just seeing God do an incredible work already. And uh, we're just a, along for the ride right now, it feels like. So, yeah. That's cool. Well, we want to pray for you, so we're going to ask for yeah. some ways to pray. But I think you got to share this. Uh, you found a place to stay. Yes. Uh, how big is that space, and how many people were, 40 people were in that space yeah. during Friendsgiving? Because you may have thought you had a crazy Thanksgiving, but listen to this. Yeah, 1,400 square foot uh, rent house that we're in right now. So, yeah. Sounds like a great time. Yeah, it was, it was fun. So, Tyler, how can we be in prayer for 2024 is right on the yeah. horizon. You're moving in, Church of the Heights. What are, you, what are you asking prayer for? Yeah, so a couple of specific ways you can pray for us. Uh, first of all, we're building what we're calling right now our core team. Uh, so that is a group of people that we are challenging and asking to commit to helping us uh, kind of launch our church out uh, more into the community in 2024. So right now we're, we're just meeting on Wednesday nights as a Bible study starting in the spring. We'll begin core team meetings uh, on Sunday evenings. That'll look a little bit more like a worship service and there'll be some training and discipleship. Um, we'll also begin to do one-on-one, -on -one, one -on two discipleship pretty heavy in the spring, taking these people that have been coming that say, hey, we're all in and we'll start discipling them, training them, uh, and then we'll be gearing up for weekly Sunday services next fall. So we'll have a pretty uh, slow on-ramp to get people trained, discipled, invested in. We'll begin to outreach in the community. So if, you, if you'll just pray for that core team, pray for those people that are coming right now, uh, that God will just unify our hearts together for his mission in Starkville, in the city, how we're serving the community, how we're reaching college students on the campus. Uh, so pray for that core team and then pray specifically uh, just for our families. Uh, you know, our, I know our family, Chris and Olivia, the, the uh, other pastor that we've planted with, uh, we're, we're kind of weary right now because we're doing lots of traveling and lots of uh, things kind of through the end of the year. But it's a good weary. 
Like, I don't, don't hear that as discouragement. It is a good, it, God is moving and he's working, but we, we're kind of tired. And so if you'll just pray for strength for our families, for my wife, for my daughter, just in, in all the chaos that has been the last few months, that'd be great. For sure. Well, we're going to do that right now. So if you can, why don't you just extend a hand of prayer? And as we close today, let's just pray for the Burlesons and Chris and Olivia as they plant in Starkville. God, we thank you again just for this time this morning as we focus on you. God, would you do the work in our hearts and our lives as we apply your word? We also want to pray for Tyler and Kristen and little Abby as they continue to plant in Starkville. God, would you give them wisdom and discernment for who needs to be on the team as they develop their core team? As they move forward into 2024, would you just bring those people uh, forward? And in faith, God, would you continue to work in their lives and disciple them well so that when they launch in the fall, God, that they would have everything they need in the giftings that you have provided for the church. We also pray for their physical health. God, would you keep them uh, walking forward towards your, your will? And God, would you give them strength and perseverance to do that? We pray for them spiritually. God, would you give them everything they need for every single day that their mercies are made new God, that would they feel that and know that you're, you're walking with them and that you're providing with them. And God, we just pray that as they uh, continue to do ministry, that they would remember that, that we're here and we're supporting them. Whether that's financially or whether that's physically or whether that's in prayer, God, we are, we are holding the rope and we are sending them well. And so God, I thank you again for this church as we continue to multiply. God, would you do that in Starkville and would you do that on the campus that needs to know the gospel truth, then also uh, how you're not only saving them, but you're giving them purpose. And as you send them out to all areas of the world, God, would you just create more and more hope and more and more love and more and more purposes of life within uh, the world. And so we, we give you the glory for that. And we ask that boldly in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us this morning. You guys are dismissed. Hey, this is Pastor Dave. I'm so thankful you chose to join us online today. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to minister to those who watch us online. We would like to connect with you. We'd like to know more about you and how we can minister most effectively to you. If you wouldn't mind, would you either scan the QR code you see on your screen or you can go to gsfbc.org slash check-in. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, how we can minister to you most effectively. We want to be the church that you can count on, the church that cares for you. Thank you again for joining us online today. Let me invite you to consider joining us in person next week. We have a 930 service in Sanders Hall or an 11 o'clock service in the venue. If you can't make it in person, I hope you'll continue to join us online each week.